This uh, conference will now be recorded. Hello, my name is Michael Eisenberg. I'm a member of the Washington Policy Center Young Professionals, and I'm on the Young Professionals Marketing Committee. Today, we're going to be talking about housing issues in Washington State and housing-related bills from the last legislative session. Here with me today is Senator Hans Zeiger from PLA, representing District 25. He serves as ranking member on two Senate committees, the Housing Stability and Affordability Committee and the State Government, Tribal Relations and Elections Committee. He's also a member of the Transportation Committee and the Human Services, Reentry and Rehabilitation Committee. Senator Zeiger, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. Um, so I guess just to start, off, what would you say are some of the most important housing issues that we're currently facing in Washington State? Well, there are a growing number of housing issues given all that's going on with COVID-19 um, as there are a growing number of economic issues in general. Um, but we were facing some housing challenges in this state uh, prior to COVID-19, even in the midst of a good economy. One of the challenges was that we had uh, fallen far short of the demand for housing in our state. Uh, there was an up for growth study that came out early this year that said that we are 225,000 units short of housing that should have been constructed between 2000 and 2015. And, and so we have to figure out ways to catch up. Now, the good news is that the legislature is paying attention to this. And in the last couple of years, we have spent more time on housing related issues than we have at any time during my time, my, my decade in the legislature. And so legislators are paying attention. There are some good ideas as well as some bad ideas out there about what to do. But, um, but I think a broad recognition that we have a supply issue, a housing supply issue. Um, there are some misdirected, misguided, I think, uh, ways of responding to that issue. Some would say, for instance, when it comes to um, the rental market and some of the pressures that are uh, coming down on the rental market that we need to regulate our way out of that, regulate landlords. And uh, there may be some limited way that that's appropriate, but by and large, again, we have a supply issue. We're not gonna regulate our way out of that. We've gotta increase supply. You know, as you have more su supply, prices can come down, uh, rents can come down. And uh, one of the challenges we're facing right now in the COVID-19 crisis as it relates to the rental market is that um, uh, while there is, it's perfectly understandable that the governor would have applied a moratorium on evictions in uh, the rental market, it's also be become a real challenge, particularly for mom and pop landlords when they're not getting rent payments. And so uh, that then increases pressure on government to come up with some kind of financial remedy to that problem. And I, I'm afraid that government just does not have the resources at hand to solve all of the kinds of financial pressures that are gonna be coming out of this. So uh, it, it's a very difficult situation. Um, but my hope is that as we move into the recovery phase, that we would see this as an opportunity to not only get back on track with, um, with, with meeting that demand uh, for new housing units in our state, but that we would see this as an opportunity to uh, create new incentives in the construction industry to stimulate that part of our economy that was shut down for a period of time, um, and uh, that we would see this as an opportunity to uh, increase housing supply in our state. Now, um, in order to increase the housing supply, do you think we should uh, increase rezoning in order to do that? And if so, how, would, how do you win a struggle against people with the not in my backyard uh, attitudes regarding rezoning. Yeah, there's a, there are good arguments to be made that we need to do that at the local level, um, and there are some who say we need to do that at the state. That we need to basically come in as a state and make um, you know kind of mandate what locals need to do in order to meet some of the, um, the challenges we face. I tend to say let's let's respect the role for local government. Let's uh, you know, that can be messy at times, it can be hard. Those are hard conversations to have about housing, but they're they're happening. And in many cases, they're being successful because people understand uh, the, the pressures that we're facing as a region. And that if we grow economically, we can grow together. And um, and so, again, I think these, these decisions do need to be made locally, but the state can have a role in incentivizing growth. Um, and it can also have a role in creating new options. I worked on legislation last year related to tiny houses, which are, I think, a market, that's a market waiting to take off. There is a certain segment of our economy that would, would really welcome the opportunity to live in 
a, a tiny house, uh, but we really didn't have a way for most local jurisdictions or most local jurisdictions shied away from that kind of activity. And uh, I think because of legislation we passed last year, I think we're going to start seeing more tiny house activity across Washington state. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, how much the uh, more of a focus the legislature is having on housing related issues. Uh, you introduced a number of uh, housing related bills in the Senate this past legislative session. Um, Senate Bill 6546, incentivizing shared housing. Uh, Senate Bill 6630, increasing accountability for public housing authorities. Senate Bill 6647, regarding Department of Commerce data on homeless claims. And Senate Bill 6649, establishing a local sales and use tax option to fund emergency homeless shelters. Uh, could you give us a brief summary on each of those? So um, I think I'll, I'll take a couple of the issues there and, and make some distinctions. Uh, there's the housing issue, and that ties in in some ways to homelessness, but but there are other issues that uh, are encompassed within that broad topic of homelessness. So I think it's important to make some distinctions there. Um, when it comes to uh, accountability for housing authorities, you know, one of the one of the things that came up last year was uh, here in Pierce County, where I am, uh, the Pierce County Housing Authority. Um, there was a, a situation where a high-ranking official within the housing authority or staff member was uh, basically siphoning money off public dollars, and uh, and that was uncovered un uncovered in a state audit. And uh, so there was some effort. Okay, we need to make sure that we're doing a better job of, of doing auditing to uncover any kind of misdoing in public housing authorities and to have that level of accountability that's needed. We also need to do a better job of tracking spending specifically when it comes to homelessness and making sure that the public has uh, means of accountability for that kind of spending because we are spending a lot of money on homelessness. Uh, as of this past legislative session in the supplemental budget, well over $700 million that can be uh, spent on housing or homelessness related programs, both in the operating and the capital budget of our state. So it's not for lack of trying. We are spending a lot of money at the state level, not to mention the local dollars and the federal dollars and the private dollars that are going in to tackle that that challenge. And um, I would argue that to effectively address homelessness, we do have to address the issues of uh, housing insecurity that people face in a market where there are too few housing options uh, and in a situation that is housing insecurity that is exacerbated by the economic pressures we're feeling in the COVID-19 era. But we also have to address the issues of substance use disorder and mental illness that so many people in our society are facing today. So many families and communities are dealing with the effects of that. We have to address that because there is a strong linkage, particularly between folks who are, who are dealing with substance use disorder and mental illness and, and, and those who are living on the street. Uh, we have to address those who are specifically unhoused and, and living on the streets. And there are um, you know, solutions there that have to do to, to really effectively deal with that population. I think we have to keep the goal of self-sufficiency in mind. It's uh, easy to come up with kind of magic bullet solutions when it when it comes to that population, but those are we have to think person by person by person when it comes to um, our street homelessness population. And finally, um, we we have to address homelessness as an issue of safety. Uh, an issue of public safety for uh, business owners who are impacted by it, an issue of safety for those who are living on the streets. And we have to get after things like the drug supply chain that are contributing to uh, people becoming addicted, people ending up on the streets and in a cycle of poverty. And uh, so it's a, it's a multi-front kind of an issue and we have to address it that way. Thank you, Senator. Um, there are you, you, a number of bills that you voted on which passed the Senate with strong majorities, and I was just curious if there's any of those bills that you're particularly glad to have helped pass. Well, um, you know, there is good bipartisan collaboration on some of the housing uh, and, and homelessness related issues. Um, you know, one of the uh, issues that I was glad to see, one of the bills I was glad to see passed last year that I thought represented some good bipartisan work as well as coalition building work where interests that don't always work together came together and found a compromise solution it was house bill 1923 and getting back to what you were asking about earlier about um uh, about you know density planning in in uh, urban areas within cities um you know infill those kinds of things those are very difficult very hard conversations at the local level but i thought we came up with a very responsible uh 
package of incentives to encourage density planning actions without mandating that. Um, that, that was led by Representative Joe Fitzgibbon in the House and uh, everybody from cities to realtors to uh, environmental interests were at the table uh, coming up with a compromise on that. There was follow up legislation to that this year. Again, I think a lot of good stakeholder work went into that. And that's that, that's where our process works, you know, where you have folks coming together, a lot of different varied interests at the table saying, OK, we can work something out here. And I think that, that is a powerful incentive. And we have to think more in terms of incentives and thinking in terms of options as opposed to mandates or as opposed to subsidies, because I think a lot of people think, well, we've got all these uh, you know, affordable housing challenges in our state. Why don't we just subsidize that by government? Government just cannot subsidize our way out of this challenge. Ultimately, the market has to be set free to do that. And, and our, I mean, in order to find the cost of varying, housing varies a lot by location. So sometimes to find affordable housing, you have to look a bit further away, but that'll require commuting longer distances. And that then gets into the entire area issue of transportation and congestion in the area. Uh, are there ways you could think we could reduce congestion so that people would have an easier time of fi of finding a place to live and buy buying into the housing market? Yeah, that, well, we, we've got to continue to make investments at the state level in transportation, no question about that. But I think one of the things, one of the lessons we're really learning from this time period in our history is just uh, that some of the ways that we have worked, some of the habits that we have of going to work, uh, maybe are worth revisiting. And uh, I think a lot of companies are discovering for the first time that maybe telecommuting is worth doing. Maybe that's something that they can sustain and that, uh, you know, may maybe not everybody all the time, but that there's some sense in doing that at least part of the time. And uh, that takes congestion off of our roadways, gives people higher quality of life, gives people more choice in how they do their work. That's something particularly that, that younger uh, that workers value is some flexibility in their work schedule. But I think that, uh, companies are finding that there's some benefit to that as well and so just you know that that is some, a category of discussion that we just have not had uh like we should in the legislative process and so i think we need to start thinking about how do we incentivize that because there's societal good that comes from that not only good to the employers and good to the employees but there's there's good for our state congestion relief uh, uh pollution reduction and so forth so let's uh, let's think about that as a public policy issue going forward do you, is the Congress considering future housing legislation as like as a direct result of COVID-19? Uh, obviously, it's on everybody's mind and there's been a wide variety of legislation due to COVID-19. But would yeah. you say is there anything planned as, that's housing specific in the future? Well, Congressman Denny Heck at the federal level from Washington State is uh, is working on legislation to provide uh, rental assistance for that rental market that we were talking about um, to help with just the, the many pressures that have come to bear there where people can't afford to pay their rent, where you have um, uh, mom and pop landlords struggling to pay their mortgages as a result of that. I mean, there's these, all these secondary and third effects uh, from everything going on. Um, so that's at the federal level. At the state level, I will tell you that I, I think people in my party and the Republican Party have got to be the voice of restraint right now because there are going to be no there, there are going to be endless demands for funding in any category of economic activity uh, to to mitigate the effects of everything that has happened and we're going to have such a decline in state revenues coming out of this that we have got to uh, really restrain ourselves at this point but also that that's an opportunity for us to rethink some of our priorities i think uh, some of the things that maybe we didn't have as high of a priority before, such as public health, I think will uh, be elevated. But but a number of other areas of, of government spending are just going to have to be cut uh, or, or at the very least maintained. And uh, this coming after several years of uh, revenue growth in Washington state, where we've gotten used to increased budget after increased budget. And that's just not going to be the case going forward. Now, we do have a big infusion of federal money coming, uh, coming our way, and uh, that'll be uh, helpful, but it's not going to be everything and it's not going to last forever. And so we're going to have to get used to restraint. And I think that's probably going to last for, that's going to have to last for a little while. It's not going to be just sort of something that's over and, and, and done with. I think probably one of the hardest things for governments at all levels is to uh, imply, require self-discipline when it comes to spending right. and debt management. Right. Um, now, uh, 
there are two housing bills in this past session that you voted against, um, both of which passed. Um, House Bill 1590 authorized a county legislative authority to impose local sales and use tax. And Senate Bill 6617 was with regards to regulations about um, accessory dwelling units. I, I, could you tell us why you voted against those bills? What you feel well, about them? <laughs> Yeah, my recollection on those bills is uh, the, the one creating a new tax. Um, you know, I, I'm hesitant to create new taxes. Um, and I, I think there are times where local options make some sense, but um, the legislature should act cautiously in that regard. And I think the message that we've been hearing from a lot, certainly the constituents who I represent, is that we need to be cautious about new taxes. Um, when it comes to accessory dwelling units, uh, I mentioned the um, tiny house legislation I worked on last year. I'm also interested in expanding the presence of accessory dwelling units. But again, I think we can do that through incentives. And uh, there was legislation this uh, past legislative session that would have mandated um, a certain presence of accessory dwelling units as well as other kinds of housing. Um, and and I. I'm uncomfortable with mandates, uncomfortable with telling local people what they have to do. I think it's, it's more important for local people to have that buy-in, give people options, and let them make choices at that local level. I'm interested in our local governments being stronger and being capable of, uh, of engaging uh, their local citizens in these conversations about, you know, how do we solve our housing challenges? And cities uh, have proven all the time uh, that, that they are capable of doing that. But it, but those are difficult conversations. I would rather have that happen than, than at the state level where we don't know uh, collectively as a legislature each and every neighborhood in the state. And so it's important to leave those decisions to the local level. It's always best to have the problem solved, as the solutions generate as close to the problem as possible. Exactly. Um, that way on all levels. Um, returning to COVID-19 for a moment, um, residential construction was initially considered a non-essential service under the stay-at-home orders that came in the end of March. And then I believe Governor Bruno Inslee announced a plan near the end of April to allow residential construction to resume, but under certain restrictions. Um, could you explain what those restrictions are and are, are they reasonable Do, or will they be impossible for residential construction to implement? Um, well, I, I think a lot of this is still unfolding and, and a lot of the construction industry is still figuring out uh, how to navigate this, um, this new reality. I, I felt that it was a mistake for uh, the governor to shut down uh, residential construction by and large. I thought that that was, uh, you know, not only, um, you know, harming the projects, harming the livelihoods of people involved in them, harming um, uh, the revenue that comes off of that to the state and local governments. Um, but I'm glad that he showed some flexibility in the most recent iteration of the um, the uh, stay home, stay healthy order. Um, so, that, But this will be something that the construction industry has to navigate carefully. And, uh, and I hope that we're able to move as quickly as possible in a way that is also responsible and, and, uh, and safe to uh, open more and more because our, our economy depends on it and, uh, and and frankly just as importantly if there is a second wave of COVID-19 say in the fall we've got to be prepared as a state to deal with that in a way that does not involve shutting down our economy. Um, we, we can't use economic shutdown sort of as an ongoing uh, way of operating. It, it just that's not going to work for our, our society. Um, so one of the things the legislature has a role, in, even though our role is quite limited under the emergency powers statute, um, one of the roles that the legislature is going to have is to plan ahead for what comes next. And we may have an opportunity to do that in a special session, uh, both to mitigate uh, and to manage the uh, budget impacts coming out of this time period, but also as we reprioritize to think, okay, how can we be prepared for the next wave or other some other future emergency that is um, gonna be challenging to the people of our state. So we've gotta be prepared, better prepared than we were certainly this uh, this time and, uh, and do it in a way that doesn't require us shutting down the economy. 
And then I guess, um, obviously, the shutdown's been going on for a while now. I've been working from home uh, remotely for a couple of months. Do, do you see a sort of, and the, day by day, the, right, the data is going to be changing, but do you see any sort of time frame for the gradual lifting of our, the COVID-19 restrictions that we're currently under? Well, the governor certainly has given um, some benchmarks and some time frames, um, but you know, a lot of the people who contact me talk about how they'd like more certainty. They would like a faster timeline on that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things I would point people to look at is an alternative plan for reopening our economy that House and Senate Republicans in our state have put forward that I think is responsible, uh, it accommodates the public health kinds of concerns that are out there, uh, but also moves us toward uh, a a faster reopening of sectors of our economy where that's appropriate. And um, so that's available on the uh, House and Senate Republican websites. Thank you. And uh, Senator, we have a very engaged audience of young professionals, and there are a couple of questions for you from them. Uh, the first question is this. It can be difficult to regularly contact our legislators to voice opinion for or against a bill, given the sheer number of bills. What suggestions do you have for young professionals to make their voices heard without succumbing to advocacy fatigue and feeling overwhelmed? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, get to know your your local legislators on a first name basis. And, uh, you know, it's not just the periodic email to your legislator, but get to know them personally. And uh, whether that's sitting down for coffee, whether that is going to visit them in their office during the legislative session. So I think just having that regular sustained kind of relationship building. And, um, you know, as you have opportunities to get involved in your community, uh, I, there'll be repeated interactions with your legislators. And so um, just look for those that, that kind of repetition as you get engaged. Thank you. And then the second question uh, from our audience is the following. Uh, if our state senator or representatives do not share the same views as we do, it can feel like our concerns fall on deaf ears. Is it effective to call or write to members of a committee of bills being heard in, even if they are not representatives of our district? I would say, uh, by and large, you know, communicate with your own legislators. Um, you know, th those are the folks, I've got 150,000 constituents. Those are the folks I work for. And, um, you know, they're my bosses and that can be challenging sometimes because I've got probably as many uh, Democrats as Republicans and, and, and a lot of independents as well. Um, and sometimes, you know, one set of constituents want, wants me to do one thing and another set wants me to do another thing. But, uh, you know, I'm hired to basically make those tough choices. Um, as far as uh, legislators outside of your district, I think where you can most have uh, some kind of influence on folks is within the political party. And that's, uh, you know, the way I explain the legislative process is that there are basically three criteria that legislators use um, uh, when they're making decisions. And the three criteria are um, their constituents, their district, uh, their party, and their conscience. You never go against conscience, but I would say most issues in the legislature are not conscience issues that are sort of this this uh, tug between right and wrong. Uh, most issues are what I would call prudential issues, where you're trying to figure out the best path forward given the limited information you have and kind of the, the totality of circumstances as you see them at that time. And so hopefully most of the time, those three factors I mentioned, your party, your district, and your conscience line up. Um, but there may be times where you have to choose your your uh, district over your party or something like that. But the party is definitely, it factors in significantly to the decisions that are made. And so um, that is one way to voice an opinion is be, by being involved in the political party structure. And um, that has an influence on the decisions that are made in Olympia and the kinds of positions that legislators take as they influence policy. Thank you. And uh, we have a few signature questions that we ask of all our guests and we want to get your responses on. Uh, what, first, what will this issue, in this case, the housing bills from the latest legislative session, uh, mean for young professionals in the state of Washington? Well, for young professionals, you know, so many of the professions touch on the housing sector of our economy. Um, you know, whether it's construction, whether it is uh, the, the rental industry, whether it is, um, you know, just so many other uh, industries that feed into housing and and um, 
So I, I would say being involved in housing policy is critical. And I think right now, more than ever in the time that I have been watching legislative action, um, uh, legislators are receptive to good ideas about housing. And there is um, uh, some bipartisan interest in this. And so I would say this is a really good time to be sharing ideas, generating ideas, discussing these things. And, um, you know, if you get, you've got a good idea about housing policy, share that with a legislator. You know, there are other areas of policy where it's pretty predictable kind of what the set of ideas are going to be that are on the table. But housing, I think there's a lot of room for very fresh thinking. And then, uh, yeah, obviously, you mentioned, you know, talking with your legislator. Uh, in addition to that, uh, do you have any suggestions about how I and other young professionals can get involved or engaged in housing issues? Um, I would say get involved in a trade organization or other, um, you know, statewide association or, or local organization that is working on housing policy that um, is of interest to you. Um, to, but pay attention to some of the emerging think tanks or uh, centers that are out there looking at housing policy specifically. I mentioned Up for Growth earlier. They're an interesting one that is uh, bringing some good ideas to the table and uh, also pointing out a lot of the kind of just basic facts that people ought to be aware of. I mentioned the 225,000 housing units short, and I think a lot of legislators are aware of that statistic because of what Up for Growth is doing. Thank you. And then our last signature question, uh, what will the impact be on the free markets in our state? Well, we, we've got to maintain, you know, uh, a, a free market when it comes to housing and frankly, when it comes to our economy. I think there's a lot of pressures right now that would lead us away from markets and toward, uh, you know, stronger government or government centralization. And we have to guard against that. We have to preserve the role of uh, small businesses, particularly, I think, in this time. I worry about, you know, the the future of small businesses in my own community. I hear from small business owners right now who are very scared. Some of them are uh, facing potential, potentially shutting down for good. And uh, that's concerning. And so we've got to figure out ways coming out of this uh, as soon as possible to uh, provide the right incentives for small businesses to keep going. We depend on small business for our economy. And, um, and certainly big business has an, a big role too. And Washington state is blessed to have some really great big businesses, but, um, you know, the free market is just essential and it is the lifeblood of uh, what makes Washington great. One of the one of the real defining things about what makes our country great. Well, Senator Zeiger, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much for me for joining with me today. Thank you, Michael. And then to our listeners, uh, if you're between 18 and 40 years of age and passionate about making a positive difference on policy issues, check us out online at WashingtonPolicy.org slash Young Professionals or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Don't forget about our upcoming virtual film screening event on May 28th from 7 to 9 p.m. Featuring Chris Rufield's film, America Lost, it's about the challenges facing families and communities in poverty and how they can be rebuilt from the bottom up. You can register free online at washingtonpolicy.org. Thank you and have a good day.